Love right here on VOA One, the hits. If I- Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Anna Mateo, and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Before writing her most recent novel, Maza Mengiste began researching the Ethiopian resistance in the 1935 invasion by Italian forces. She discovered photographs of women dressed in military clothing with weapons over their shoulders. She organized them by date and location. Mengiste soon began to gain an understanding of the conflict she never learned about in school. These women decided to join in the front lines, she told VOA. I had never heard that story. And this is what really inspired me to continue this, because if I didn't know it, and if a lot of other Ethiopians weren't speaking about it, this means maybe that nobody really had been paying attention to this. Mengiste found photographs of Ethiopian girls taken by Italian soldiers. Some photos were used to persuade men to join the conflict. Others were much darker and showed the horror of war. They were taken by soldiers for fun, and they were passed around as jokes and as postcards to send home. And that was the side of war also that I wanted to show, she said. The research led to her 2020 book, The Shadow King. It tells the story of Herut a mistreated girl who becomes the personal guard for a person claiming to be the exiled Ethiopian ruler, Haile Selassie. The novel has won worldwide praise and was a top competitor for the Man Booker Prize. However, the honor went to another book. Mengiste's book revisits part of Forgotten History, said Lee Child. He is a writer of 24 novels and one of the judges for the 2020 Booker Prize. The story is important, really the opening shots of the Second World War, but rarely told before, Child said in a video discussing the novel. Its place on the short list merely confirms its status as one of the great novels of the year. Mengiste was born in Ethiopia in 1971. Her family left the country when she was four years old. They lived in Nigeria and Kenya before moving permanently to the United States. As a girl, she remembered moments of her first years in Ethiopia. But it was not until she was much older that she considered writing them down. I'm surprised I kept those memories because I was very young, she said. But I think that the shock of what I experienced, both in Ethiopia but also the migration, was so intense and so deep that everything froze for me and stayed inside. And so I would keep coming back. Mengiste's parents did not immediately welcome her decision to become a writer but she felt she had stories to tell. She believes other Ethiopians feel the same, but may not have a way to share their stories with the world. Mengiste said that history and literature across East Africa is told through spoken word. I think all of us remember those moments when we are sitting around at a dinner table or sitting having a meal and someone starts a story. 
and the entire room moves in that direction. Everyone is laughing, or people are crying. That's a book inside a human being, and my inspirations came from my relatives. Some of them didn't go to school. Now, Mengiste wants to help new authors. She has helped produce a collection of stories by 14 Ethiopian writers called Addis Ababa Noir. She believes there is a lot of talent that could be shared with more people with the help of translators and publishing companies. Greek scientists on the volcanic island of Lesvos say they have found a 20 million year old fossilized tree. The rare find was discovered during road work near an ancient forest on the eastern Mediterranean island. The area was petrified millions of years ago. Digging or excavating at the site began in 1995. It is the first tree in the area to be found in such good condition, complete with branches and roots, said Professor Nikos Zoros. He is with the Museum of Natural History of the Petrified Forest of Lesvos. The roots and branches of the tree were still unbroken, after 20 million years. Zuros said it was a special find, one that he had never seen before. It is a unique find, he said. It is preserved in excellent condition. And from studying the fossilized wood, we will be able to identify the type of plant it comes from. The 15,000-hectare petrified forest of Lesvos is a protected site of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO. The forest is the result of a volcanic eruption 20 million years ago. Lava from the volcano covered the island's ecosystem which at that time was subtropical forest. The fossilized tree is about 19 meters long. It was preserved by heavy amounts of volcanic ash after it fell. A large number of fruit tree leaves also were found nearby. The trees and animal bones found in the same general area add to the history and understanding of life that once existed there. During the excavations, the various forests that existed between 17 and 20 million years ago on Lesvos are being uncovered, said Zuros. He and his team plan to rebuild the ecosystem that existed during that period. For further study, he and his team transported the tree from the site using a special support system and metal structure. I'm Ana Mateo. You may have noticed brighter night skies recently as we experienced a full moon. NASA reports the event, called the Wolf Moon, began Thursday afternoon and ended Saturday morning. But did you notice any changes in your personal sleep patterns in the days leading up to the full moon? As the latest full moon was beginning, 
a new study was released suggesting that a full moon can affect human sleep cycles. Researchers confirmed that the nights leading up to a full moon have more natural light available after the sun goes down. The new research found that in the days before a full moon, people go to sleep later in the evening and sleep for shorter periods of time. The results were reported in a study appearing in the publication Science Advances. The research was led by biology professor Horatio de la Iglesia of the University of Washington. When we looked at the data, it was right there. We didn't expect that pattern at all, de la Iglesia said in a video about the findings. He said the study provided clear evidence that a person's sleep-wake cycle is synchronized with changes the moon goes through. The moon takes 27.3 days to orbit Earth, but it takes 29.5 days to complete a full cycle from new moon to new moon. The new study measured the sleep patterns of test subjects as the moon progressed through at least one whole 29.5-day cycle. Some subjects were tested through two moon cycles. On average, people involved in the study slept about 52 minutes less on nights before a full moon. They also went to bed about 30 minutes later. The research showed that people had the latest bedtimes and the shortest amount of sleep during the nights that were three to five days before a full moon. I became one of the subjects of the study, and when I looked back on my own data, I could not believe how much my sleep changed, de la Iglesia said. Past studies by de la Iglesia's team and other research groups have shown that access to electricity has a clear effect on sleep. So the team included this element in their research. The study involved 98 individuals living in three different communities of Toba indigenous people in Argentina. Each community had different access to electricity. One rural community had no electricity access, while a second had only limited access. A third community was in a more populated area and had full access to electricity. Sleep data was collected electronically from the individuals through wrist monitors. The research team said it believes this method resulted in more effective data than some past studies that depended only on user-reported sleep data. In addition to the indigenous communities, the researchers also examined sleep data on 464 college students in the Seattle, Washington area. That data had been collected for a separate study. The researchers said they discovered the same moon cycle patterns in the sleep data from the students. Although the effect is more robust in communities without access to electricity, the effect is present in communities with electricity, de la Iglesia said. The scientists say further research is needed to help explain other possible causes for the changes in sleep patterns in the test subjects. 
Such causes could involve biological differences in individuals or social patterns within communities. I'm Brian Lynn. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Vice President Calvin Coolidge became president in 1923, following the death of President Warren Harding. Coolidge quickly gained the trust of most Americans by investigating the crimes of Harding's top officials. The conservative economic policies of the new president also won wide support. Coolidge had one year to prove his abilities to the American people before the election of 1924. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe tell us about that election. Coolidge was a quiet man who believed in limited government policies, but his silence hid a fighting political spirit. Coolidge had worked for many years to gain the White House he would not give it up without a struggle. Coolidge moved quickly after becoming president to gain control of the Republican Party. He named his own advisors to important jobs, and he replaced a number of officials with people whose loyalty he could trust. Most Republicans liked Coolidge, they felt his popular policies would make him a strong candidate in the presidential election. For this reason, Coolidge faced only one serious opponent for the Republican presidential nomination in 1924. Coolidge's opponent was the great automobile manufacturer Henry Ford of Michigan. Ford had been a Democratic candidate for the Senate in 1918. He lost that election. But after the election, some people in his company began to call for Ford to be the Republican presidential nominee in 1924. Ford was one of history's greatest inventors and manufacturers but he had limited skills in politics. Ford was poorly educated. He had extreme opinions about a number of groups. He hated labor unions, the stock market, dancing, smoking, and drinking alcohol. But most of all, Ford hated Jews. He produced a number of publications accusing the Jewish people of organizing international plots. At first, Ford appeared to be a strong opponent to Coolidge. But soon he realized that Coolidge was too strong politically. His economic policies were popular among the people, and the nation was at peace. The party could not deny Coolidge's nomination. Ford himself 
put an end to his chances by telling the nation that it was perfectly safe with Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge won the presidential nomination easily at the 1924 Republican Convention in Cleveland, Ohio. The Republican delegates chose Charles Dawes of Illinois to run with him as the vice presidential candidate. The Democratic Party was much more divided. Many of the groups that traditionally supported Democratic candidates now were fighting against each other. For example, many farmers did not agree on policies with people living in cities. The educated did not agree with uneducated people. And many Protestant workers felt divided from Roman Catholic and Jewish workers. These differences made it hard for the Democratic Party to choose a national candidate. There was little spirit of compromise. Two main candidates campaigned for the Democratic nomination. The first was former Treasury Secretary William McAdoo. McAdoo had the support of many Democrats because of his strong administration of the railroads during the World War. Democratic voters in southern and western states liked him because of his conservative racial policies and his opposition to alcohol. The second main candidate was Alfred Smith, the governor of New York. Smith was a Roman Catholic. He was very popular with people in the eastern cities, Roman Catholics, and supporters of legal alcohol. But many rural delegates to the convention did not trust him. The Democratic Party convention met in New York City. It quickly became a battle between the more liberal delegates from the cities and the more conservative delegates from rural areas. It was July. The heat was intense. Speaker after speaker appealed to the delegates for votes. One day passed, then another. For nine days, the nation listened on the radio as the delegates argued about the nomination. The delegates voted 95 times without success. Finally, McAdoo and Smith agreed to withdraw from the race. Even then, the delegates had to vote eight more times before they finally agreed on compromise candidates. The Democratic delegates finally chose John Davis to be their presidential nominee. Davis was a lawyer for a major bank. He had served briefly under President Wilson as ambassador to Britain. The delegates also chose Charles Bryan to be the vice presidential candidate. Bryan was the younger brother of the famous Democrat and populist leader William Jennings Bryan. There also was a third party in the 1924 election. Many of the old progressive supporters of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson opposed the choices of the Republicans and Democrats. They thought the country needed another candidate to keep alive the spirit of reform. Progressive candidates had done well in the congressional election of 1922. But following the election, communists had gained influence in one of the major progressive parties. Most progressives did not want to join with communists, so they formed a new progressive party. The new party, named Senator Robert La Follette, 
of Wisconsin to be its presidential candidate. La Follette campaigned for increased taxes on the rich and public ownership of water power. He called for an end to child labor and limits on the power of the courts to interfere in labor disputes. And La Follette warned the nation about the dangers of single large companies gaining control of important industries. Coolidge won the 1924 election easily. He won the electoral votes of 35 states to just 12 for Davis of the Democrats. La Follette won only Wisconsin, his home state. Coolidge also won more popular votes than the other two candidates together. The American people voted for Coolidge partly to thank him for bringing back honesty and trust to the White House following the crimes of the Harding administration. But the main reason was that they liked his conservative economic policies and his support of business. La Follette's progressive party died following the 1924 election. Most of his supporters later joined the Democrats, but the reform spirit of their movement remained alive through the next four years. They were difficult years for progressives. Conservatives in Congress passed laws reducing taxes for corporations and richer Americans. Progressives fought for reforms in national agriculture policies. Most farmers did not share in the general economic growth of the 1920s. Instead, their costs increased while the price of their products fell. Many farmers lost their farms. Farmers and progressives wanted the federal government to create a system to control prices and the total supply of food produced. They said the government should buy and keep any extra food that farmers produced, and they called for officials to help them export food. Coolidge and most Republicans rejected these ideas. They said it was not the business of a free government to fix farm prices, and they feared the high costs of creating a major new government department and developing export markets. Coolidge vetoed three major farm reform bills following his election. The debate over farm policy was in many ways like the debate over taxes or public controls on power companies. There was a basic difference of opinion about the proper actions of government. More conservative Americans believed the purpose of government was to support private business, not to control it. But more liberal Americans believed that government needed to do more to make sure that citizens of all kinds could share the nation's wealth more equally. Coolidge and the Republicans were in control in the 1920s. For this reason, the nation generally stayed on a conservative path. The Democrats and progressives would have to wait until later to put many of their more liberal ideas into action. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 